Welcome to the Harvey B. Gann Center's Family First, Arts from a Distance. For the next hour, we will take a journey through pioneer photographer Gordon Park's history and artistic style, followed by some fun tips and tricks of photography led by image activist Alvin C. Jacobs Jr. Let's get started. We hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hey guys, and welcome to Family First. If you guys have any questions at all, uh, please place them in the chat room. And don't forget that as soon as you take your images, as soon as you take your photos, please send them to us. The information will be in the chat window right now. Give you. Okay. Should be situated. Good. Okay. Gordon Rogers Alexander Buchanan Parks was born November 30th in Fort Scott, Kansas. His mother passed away when he was only 14. He bought his first camera at the age of 25. The first roll of film he ever, ever took to be developed really caught the interest of the developing company. They advised him to try to enter into the world of fashion photography in St. Paul, Minnesota. There was a clothing company asked him, you know, could he, could he photograph, you know, some of their clothing? And he said yes, even though he had never, ever, ever tried that before. After he got the job, there was a young lady, her name was uh, Marva Lewis, who was world heavyweight champion at the time, uh, Joe Lewis, his wife. She convinced him to move to Chicago to begin his entire career then. The world took off. Let's fast forward a little bit. Mr. Parks began photographing for the Office of War Information and became a freelance photographer for Vogue magazine, one of the first African Americans at the time ever. But what's more important, his, his creative photo essays that he took upon himself, he wasn't commissioned in the projects, he just decided that these were photo essays that he needed to take upon himself. He was hired by Life magazine as a freelance photographer. Life magazine at the time was the most popular magazine in the country and he was hired as their first African-American freelance photographer. That's how he was able to photograph Malcolm X. That's why he was able to photograph Muhammad Ali. That's how he was able to photograph almost every single icon uh, from the 40s, 60s, 70s throughout his career. What's interesting is that he was the first of many. He was the first of many, meaning before him, there really wasn't anyone who was doing the work that he was doing. So when you see um, brothers like Ryan Coogler and you see um, Samuel Jackson and just brothers who are just really doing these amazing things, 
Um, Gordon Parks was first. He wasn't an actor, but he was a director and he was a writer. Let me give you else an idea. <clears throat> See what we have here on our next slide. Now, when you guys are looking at this photo, we don't know if this is 1960, 1970, or this is 2020. This is exactly the same things that we're going through right now. That's what made Gordon Parks so interesting. The work that he documented and the work that he, that he captured is iconic because we're still going through it right now. So if this photo was in color, it really doesn't even have to be in color because sometimes I shoot in black and white as well, but we're living in a police state. It isn't just the message on, on the poster. It isn't just you know, the message and what was written. It's the entire climate you know, of, um, of our community. You know, we were going through it then and we're going through it again right now. So Mr. Gordon Parks was um, cemented in uh, the history of not only civil rights and arts and activism, but also social justice. Now, this image, some of you guys are a little younger. You don't know who this is. Let me give you an idea. At one time, this was the best boxer in the entire world. This is Mr. Muhammad Ali. Having access to Muhammad Ali is almost like having, um, oh wait, they said they can't see the images. Oh, let's see, let's see, we can't see the images. I don't know why you can, okay, somebody can, I'm sorry. Um, having, having photographed Muhammad Ali is almost like photographing, and I'm, I'm gonna be respectful here, LeBron James, right? And I don't mean just LeBron James while you're in the game. You know, you're watching and you're from the stands. I mean, in his most intimate moments, him training, him with his family, um, him out to eat, him just hanging out, him just being himself. That is just the access of that, right? Mr. Gordon Parks had access to the entire world. He, at the time, was the single most famous African-American photographer in the world. So to have a photo captured by him really meant the world. It means that you had really arrived. I want you guys to look at this real quick. This is him in his own words. I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. When I heard the news account, I was so shocked. I was came to a dead standstill. I got a call from Phil Cunard, who was acting as managing editor of Life at the time. He said, I want you to write a piece. And don't worry about taking the pictures, just write what you feel. Dr. King spent the last years of his life preaching love to men of all colors. And for all this, a man white like you blasted a bullet through his neck. And this just about eliminated the last symbol of peace between us. My words stared back at me when I saw them in print. Anger, I realized, had swept me dangerously close to hatred. Violence marred a good part of my youth and became my enemy. Fortunately, the common sense which my parents pounded into me would help select the most powerful weapons to use against it. Photography, writing, music, and film became those weapons. Once when I was traveling with the Panthers, the young Marxist asked me if I would write a choice of weapon the same way I had written it a few years before. He says, with these honky cops following us with the guns trained on us. We were writing, it was during a storm, I think it was in Oakland. And I said, look, you have a 45 automatic on your lap. I have a 35 millimeter camera. I said, if they start shooting in here, I'm gonna die with you. Well, sure enough, the young man was killed in an ambush by the police in Los Angeles two weeks later. My story was published and she went all over the world. So in the end, in, in that particular case, my weapon was the strongest. I was at the time communications secretary of the Black Panther Party and Eldridge was the Minister of Information. There weren't that many well-known black photojournalists who worked for mainstream magazines, so we all knew about Gordon. Gordon was famous. There was no one whose photographs would have the exposure of Gordon. For that era, for 1969, 1970, to have Gordon Park's photographs, 
is striking. We see. Okay. Are we back? I think we're back. Let's see. I believe we're back. Okay. That was powerful, wasn't it? Um, I wanted you guys to, to kind of see and feel um, how he felt in his own words. You know, that was, um, I was looking, you know, I was, I, was, I was researching, you know, some of his work and I'm like, you know what, I need to find something of, of, of him saying, you know, how he felt about his work. And I, I mean, I got right to it. it I've read every book, I've uh, uncovered most of his interviews, I've seen almost all of his photos that I've had access to. But that video, I got right to the point where I needed to get to without even watching the entire uh, documentary again that time. But someone asked me, um, how do I feel about uh, police brutality? I've spent the last 10 years uh, documenting um, issues of social justice around the country. Um, some of the cities you know, you've heard of and some of the ones you haven't. Uh, this was one of the most uh, recent instances in Brunswick uh, where a young man that was jogging, um, Maud, um, was killed um, in his own community. So he wasn't killed by you know, members of law enforcement but um, white supremacy and, and, and racism is ingrained uh, throughout every single aspect of our society, definitely every single system that governs our country. This image, um, sometimes, again, you don't know, you don't know the years you know, from, from documenting. You can kind of tell by the fashion. You can kind of tell you know, by the colors. Um, this was in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. And it looks the same you know, from the 60s to the 70s to the 50s. Everything looks the same because we're going through um, the exact same processes. Let me look at this a little bit larger so I can see it. Um, wait a minute, let me pull this up. There we go. Perfect. So this was in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, this was where uh, George Floyd you know, was killed by a member of law enforcement. I arrived right when this was happening. So if you see in your left corner, that is the auto zone on fire and in the corner um, in the right corner in the back, I hadn't seen the target yet that was on fire or the cup foods that was on fire, but that was burning as soon as we walked up. So where those two individuals are, um, that's where everything was happening. There were thousands of people outside then. That was around 11 o'clock um, at night. And I don't know, maybe about an hour later, I had sprained my ankle. Uh, so I've been, I've been injured, you know, throughout um, the past few months, you know, during the, uh, the uprisings and um, the protests around America. But, you know, the work looks the same. You know, the only thing difference really is, um, is going to be the clothing. You know, it's, it's, we're experiencing some of the same things, you know, that many of us have experienced our entire lives, depending on how old we are. And um, documentation is, um, is really one of the only ways that we know about what's really going on in our country, because we can't, you know, move around the world like that, that quickly. Um, this image here, I, I, I captured uh, the, uh, the West End mural off uh, Betty's Ford Road in Charlotte. And sometimes I, I edit in black and white and sometimes you know, I process in color, but I always photograph in color. Um, I don't think I've ever shot an image in black and white outside of uh, using um, a black and white you know, uh, film in an analog camera. I like to edit in color because I can still maintain uh, the information, the color information, and I can um, you know, manipulate it as I see fit. This was in Alabama. This was the, um, not, not the, the, the Civil Rights Museum, but kind of the Anti-Slavery Museum. Um, in, in Alabama. And that was one of the most who emotional moments, you know, that I've spent, you know, in the past few years. Um, it was just heavy. It was really, really heavy. They have these very large uh, metal steel memorials of all the individuals who've been lynched in the United States of America that have been um, doubly verified, meaning they found the information in more than one place. And this is just kind of um, a depiction of, uh, I don't even like using the word slaves, right? Um, enslaved Africans, right? Like, like they, 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 they weren't slaves, right? I don't, I don't like saying that they were, they were captured Africans, you know, they were um, taken, you know, from their country, from their homeland and held against their will and forced to work. But this is a depiction um, of them in a beautiful sculpture in Alabama. This image here, wow. Um, this is one of uh, Mr. Gordon Park's most iconic images. Do you see the temperatures in this? Even if she was dressed differently, you could tell that this was in the 60s. That to me is so beautiful about art and about photography. You can time stamp images, you know, based upon the color temperature. In the 70s, it was a little warmer 
it was a little more orange or a little more yellower, you know, but we use a lot of um, blue greens, you know, which was, you know, depicted a little bit cooler of a temperature, not a physical temperature, but, you know, a look um, in photography in the 60s. So it kind of, uh, kind of stamped, you know, uh, the era, even without, without text, even without telling you, you know, where it is and, you know, what it is. So I really, I really, really love photography as far as telling our stories um, and, and, and historical components. This is me in Minneapolis in front of the, uh, the Capitol building. Boy, let me tell you, uh, and then I, I don't know if I had the boot on then, but I had it on, you know, a few hours after that. I mean, sometimes I just, I just, I just become overwhelmed with emotion and, and I, I get in conversations I probably shouldn't be in. But um, before I looked around, you know, this, this video is going, um, is going viral. And it was just me just explaining, you know, kind of my position. You know, I'm not right, I'm not wrong. It's just my opinion. And I respect, you know, other individuals' opinion. You don't have to call them out of their name. You don't have to be disrespectful. You know, as a, uh, as a documentarian, as a photographer, as an image activist, you know, I go to a lot of places and I see a lot of things. So my opinion uh, doesn't make it again, right or wrong. It makes it different. Um, but I like to share that opinion, you know, if, if, if I have the opportunity. So this was in uh, Minneapolis in front of uh, the capital of uh, Minnesota, the state of Minnesota uh, last month during the uh, George Floyd protests. So this image here is one of, uh, hold on real quick, let me get this for you guys. This is, when well, we're talking about techniques, right? Uh, Gordon Parks, one of his, his signature styles was capturing images moving, right? So, so he wouldn't pose his subjects. He wouldn't say, okay, one, two, three, pose. You know, one, two, three, pose, do this, do that. He just captured you in your natural element. And to me, that is amazing all by itself. That, that kind of dictates my style, even when I'm, when I'm capturing portraits. Um, I, I use my, my photo, photo journalist um, lens, right? Not, not a physical camera lens, but I use my photo journalist lens and I try to tell the story um, with my subjects or with my, my, my clients in an element where they're comfortable or maybe uncomfortable. But as long as the image comes across um, powerful, you know, I think that it's a winning combination. But he was one of the first individuals that captured his, his subjects moving. Everyone else would pose their images and it was static. His people were always moving, and that just just made it made it more lifelike. If we're talking still photography, make your subjects comfortable. Um, another tip, right? Now this is this is Malcolm X. Uh, if this isn't my most favorite uh, figure of history, it, it's probably Malcolm X and maybe you know Gordon Parks a second. But if you look at his face, right, like he knows what he's doing, and he knows that you knows what he's doing. To get this close to uh, Brother Malcolm X, he had to trust you. You know, he um, he had he had security. He had you know the brothers of uh, the Fruit of Islam, the FOI, um, as his as his security detail everywhere he went. For you to get this close to this brother, you weren't a member of uh, the Nation of Islam. You weren't on the security detail. You had to be a trusted um, a trusted friend. You know, you had to be an ally. And making you know your subjects comfortable, they began doing what they would normally do. You know, you don't have to be a professional photographer to get the best. Um, views, you know, from your subjects, just have to make them comfortable, you know, let them know that, you know, you aren't going to hurt them. And I mean that not just physically, but when they see the photo, it isn't going to be one that they aren't going to like, they aren't going to appreciate. So you try to do the best you can with what you have, and even if, even though you aren't a professional, you're like, okay, well, if I was in this photo, how could I make this the best photo of me? But you don't always get a chance to do that. So you have it in your mind, like, let me just capture the best that I can of them. But making your subjects comfortable will go a long way a very long way in um, getting getting your best images of your family, of your friends, like your parents, right? You could be in your home right now. Take a picture of your mom, you know? Um, take a picture of, of, your, of your pet, you know? Take a picture of um, a book, you know? And, and then send that to us, right? You know, check out the chat area. Um, take a photo of, of, of I mean, you may have your cell phone, you know, you may have um, your, your, your mirrorless, you may have your, you know, DSLR, use your camera, use your phone, whatever you have, you know, to capture an image, an image with right now of whatever's in front of you, you know, um, if you look in the chat right now, um, we would really, we would really love to see those and just, you know, give us an idea of, you know, what, where you are, you know, what you're doing, you know, what you're thinking about, because that's what photography really does. It stamps time. It doesn't have to be something as iconic as, you know, an image of um, Brother Malcolm X. It could just be something that means a lot to you. 
or it doesn't have to mean anything. It's, it could just be a very well um, composed and um, a well lit, you know, photograph. That would work. But send those into us as soon as you get a chance. Let's look at what slide we have next. So empower your subjects. I'm going to use this 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 um this image um, for two comments. Empowering your subjects. When you look at at this brother here, this is Richard Roundtree from the movie Shaft. This was one of the first blockbuster, big budget films that a black man was able to direct. And I wrote a little something for this. I want to read you uh, read read to you guys. Um, this was in 1970. 1971, I'm sorry. But in 1969, um, Mr. Gordon Parks became the first man uh, to direct a major Hollywood movie. And I mentioned, I mentioned Black Panther before for a reason. So Ryan Coogler, right? And you hear this a lot, you know, this person was able um, to run because this person walked, right? So Ryan Coogler was able to, to direct this Marvel comic blockbuster film um, partly due to the work that Gordon Parks did. He was the first black man to, to direct a major Hollywood film. This is when 1971 Shaft, you know, if you have parents that are, you know, um, around my age, but older, um, they're going to remember this movie. And some of them, you know, maybe your grandparents saw this movie in the theater. Shaft was a bad man, right? So look, look at how he's poised. Look how cool he is. He reminds me of my father a lot. So if he was a little bit lighter, oh, Ryan Coogler, is the uh, director of the Marvel comic uh, film Black Panther? So he was he was a um, an African American man, a black man who who directed one of the biggest blockbusters of last year. So imagine how cool um, Michael B. Jordan was, right, in this movie. Imagine how 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 powerful you know Will Smith looked in Ali. You know, um, imagine these brothers, but thirty years ago, forty years ago, this was Richard Roundtree. You know. Um, these brothers are able to do what they're doing now because of the work that these black men, you know, put in prior. So you might not know who, who, who Gordon Parks is as a director, right? And you may or may not know who, who Ryan Coogler is as a director, but you know the movie Black Panther. You know Michael B. Jordan, right? This is kind of the same thing, but just 40 years prior. So I kind of wanted to give you, you know, an idea of, of how powerful these films were, even though you've never, you may have never heard of them. You may have never heard of the, uh, the uh, directors this is the impact that they had back then. Shaft created an entire new genre of music, um, of, of movies, film. They called it black exploitation. This is where uh, Dolomite came from. If you remember Dolomite is my name, it was a movie that um, the genius of, 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 of comedy, uh, Mr. Eddie Murphy uh, remade, I believe it was last year or you know the year before last. But this movie came right after this. So this was the first one. And then a lot of these movies start coming after you know, Shaft's big score um, was in 1973, I believe. It wasn't as large as this, but it was still a hit. So you have all of these films that are um, that are that are going on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the movies that are that are going on came from back then. You know, we didn't really. They always say that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, but we have to pay homage to the individuals who really, really started this. So I'm going to show you guys something. Also. Please, please, please remember to take photos. Um, it's really, 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 really important because um, we'd love to see those. This here is a Bell & Howell auto load camera. This is a camera that an individual would have in their home if they had money, right? You would take this, this would be like a home camera. You could take this and wind it and then you'd have your own home movies. Not everyone had access to these. These were really expensive back in the day. And this is a eight millimeter film. This camera is a Nikon uh, F series. This is uh, one of the cameras that Mr. Gordon Park shot with the most. He used to use, uh, you know, Rolleiflex and things like that. I don't know if you guys can see this, um, but he would shoot with uh, Nikon mostly. I'm looking at if you guys can see me. Okay, you can't see it. Great. Um, he would shoot with Nikon mostly, but he started out with like Rolleiflex. He bought his first camera, again, when he was 25, he bought it for like $20 or something like that. And he just picked it up and he just began to master it, right? He wasn't always a photographer, but at 25, he was already, he was already a grown man. So I want to encourage you all that you don't have to wait until, you know, you're my age, you know, at, at um, 46 to begin 
whatever art discipline um, that you're choosing to master. You can start whenever you see fit. You can start at age seven, age eight, nine, 10, 11. You can start at 50, you can start at 60. But to get good at something, it's gonna take time. Um, I started I started with Nikon, interestingly, interestingly enough. Um, and now I'm at the, uh, the Nikon mirrorless version. Not because of any brand loyalty, but it's just kind of what I started with. And it got comfortable, you know? Um, I understand Nikon better than I understand Canon. I understand, you know, the, um, the, um, the inner workings and the settings of Nikon better than I do uh, Canon or Sony. But I wanna show you guys something real quick. And it's not necessarily attached to an image, but I wanna talk about uh, Gordon Park's style. You know, you'll hear style as, um, as an artist, you know? Um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll do that afterwards. Give you guys um, a couple of tips. Um, I want you to see this real quick. This is um, one of the things that I learned uh, my during my brief education, you know, in um, in in art school, and it's uh, it's called the rule of thirds. If you look at this image, right, do you see how how Luke, who's a um, Grammy nominated uh, artist from Charlotte, North Carolina, who's on the uh, Dreamville label, uh, owned by J. Cole, he's not directly in the center. If you have a cell phone or you have a DSLR or you have a mirrorless camera or you're using you know, an iPad, don't place the subject directly in the middle. If you break it down, right? And I, I know you can't see how, how I'm doing this with the screen, but the rule of thirds, if there's an image here, I'm sorry, if there's a grid here, there's a grid here and there's a grid here, you want it to the right or to the left of center. That's going to draw your eye to the image. That balances the image. I know it looks like it's off, but it's not off. The rule of thirds is going to draw your eye to the subject and it's going to allow you to, to look at the information um, that's in front of you. You don't have to do a whole lot of, um, of explaining, you know, once you properly compose a photo, people know what's supposed to be important. And it doesn't matter what, what the subject is doing, as long as it's placed properly, whether to the right or to the left of the center in the rule of thirds, you're going to get an amazing image even if it's just a picture of nothing, but it's balanced properly. This image, have you guys ever uh, been asked to take a photograph of a family member or a friend, like what you're doing right now, right? Almost instinctively, someone wants to put their back to the wall, right? They, they, they always want to put their back to the wall. Like, oh, wait, let me put my back directly against the wall. Try not to allow them to do that. If you look at this image, right, have them stand away from the background. Have them step back a little bit, a foot, two feet, three feet. Create separation from the individual that you're photographing and the back of the wall. Whether it's a car, um, whether it's a tree, don't allow them to physically touch the tree because again, you wanna have separation. And depending on your, your level of skill or um, the, the, the technical ability of your camera, you might not be able to get the best photo because your subject is too close to them. What you'll notice in portraits, and you'll see, you know, I, I, I want to blow the, uh, blur the background. You'll hear that a lot. How do you blur the background out? How do you blur the background out? <clears throat> That's mostly done with what's called aperture. When you look at a lens, right? When you look at a lens, this is opening the aperture. It's closing the aperture. So you want to be able to have access to that but sometimes your camera can't do that. So you wanna create the separation with the individual physically. That will give you at least a little bit of blur in the background and it doesn't pull the entire photo together. So you'll have a separation between your dog and the wall, right? Or your son or your daughter, or your brother, or your sister, or your mom or your dad, and maybe the couch. You know, have a little bit of separation. It'll create um, a much more flattering photo. It'll, it'll, it'll create a much better photo, even though you don't have you know, maybe, you know, the best equipment. You can still have great photos if you just kind of pay attention to those techniques. I can't remember if I had another one or not. Because if not, oh, this one. Lighting, 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 lighting. Um, lighting will mean the difference between a really great photo and a photo that's just okay. What lighting does, if it's controlled, it allows you to have more detail in your images. If you take your phone, right, into your closet and you take a picture and, and you have just enough light to where the camera is able to focus, the quality of the image isn't going to be that good. 
because the ISO, which is the light sensitivity, right, of your camera or of your phone is going to have to be so high to overcompensate for the lack of low light. Now, on the flip side, right, you don't want to have too much light or you don't want to not be able to control your light because then you blow out the image and you lose detail as well. So if you guys can look, you see where uh, Lute is painting and then you see the light is coming kind of right from the upper left corner. Now, if I would have stepped back, I probably couldn't have gotten the image at all because the light would have been directly in the lens and I wouldn't have been able to focus at all. So more importantly than um, the expense of your, of your camera, more, more important than you know, your ability to buy the best of everything is your ability to control your lighting. I can take an amazing photo um, with almost anything and at least amazing to me. I can take it with almost anything. I don't need a, a $10,000 camera, you know, to, to capture a beautiful image because I understand what's going on, you know, inside the photo. What having a great camera does though, what having a great camera does is give you more control and it makes the job a little bit easier, but it doesn't do all the work for you. There's nothing wrong with shooting on automatic if you're just starting, right? But if you have, you know, a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera, it doesn't matter how much it costs, try to shoot on manual if you can and just kind of begin to work it out. You know, just what's the worst that can happen? Um, what I like to do is, you know, with my images, I like to have my ISO, which is again, the light sensitivity, which you'll only be able to access on, you know, physical cameras. You, you wanna have that number down. And, you know, when you look at, when you look at the aperture, which is, you know, the lens opening, right? Like 1.8 is this much light and 5.6 is this much light. So when you're looking at your camera, like why is this image so dark? Well, maybe you just open up the aperture some, right? To 3.5 or 2.8 or 1.8, depending on, you know, the capability of your lenses and you'll get more light. I like to keep my ISO down. And your shutter speed is important as well because if it's too low and you're letting in a lot of light, um, you'll see vibration in the image and that's called camera shake. It's because you don't have a stable uh, level of control you know, with your camera and you have your shutter speed too slow, which you can use, we call it dragging you know, the light or you know, painting with light in low light situations, but you have to use a tripod. Now, let me give you guys an idea of something else, hold on. When I, when I first began, um, you know, photographing, and I started looking at, you know, what I was going to do, you know, you're walking around, you know, the city of Charlotte and, you know, choosing your subject and its surroundings. This is right uptown, um, right on 7th Street, right across the street from uh, First Ward Park. And you've seen this a million times. I took this with my phone, but I understand, again, composition. I understand the rule of thirds. I understand lighting. And sometimes, you know, the best image is the one you have to work for. You know, I didn't take this. I think I kneeled down and there was a little bit of an angle and it might not make the greatest image, but it makes your image different. Try to take photos in a manner that, that maybe other people wouldn't think of. You don't have to, you know, do a cartwheel. You don't have to do a backflip. I'm not saying that, but maybe use a different angle. You know, if you see everyone else taking a photo one way, maybe you take it another way so you can have a different perspective. And that's what makes things, that's what makes things art. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be the same way. If you have 50 people and you give 50 of them 50 different cameras, everyone's gonna have a different image. And there's a good reason for that. You don't wanna have work that looks like everyone else's. Um, you wanna have an individual uh, relationship with your subject and an individual relationship with your art. So <clears throat> when you choose your subject and its surroundings, you choose your subject and your surroundings. You don't have to let anybody choose that for you. You decide where you wanna stand. You, 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 you decide where you wanna walk around and when you decide to do that, you'll become a better photographer. You'll understand, you know, exactly what it takes, you know, to get the images that you've always wanted, but you're going to have to do the work. And part of the work is understanding what you're doing. And I've said this a couple of times today, you know, um, the best camera is the one you have. It doesn't matter what you have at home. It doesn't matter what you have in your car. If you see something that you want to capture and all you have is your phone, which is what I took this with, you can capture a great image if you know what you're doing. You just have to be cognizant. You just have to like, like pay attention to what you're doing with your angles. You know, you have to pay attention to how your lighting is set up. You have to pay attention, you know, to any other uh, obstructions. If you can control all of that, it's going to be an amazing day for you uh, in the world of photography. But if you don't, you're just gonna have 10,000 photos, you know, in your iPhone or 10,000 photos in your Android, and you're not gonna like any of them. 
since I um, have a film background, you know, and I still shoot and I still develop film, I, I shoot with 36 exposures or pressing my shutter 36 times um, in my mind. So I don't just shoot a lot and hope that I get a great image. It's okay to slow down. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to ask, you know, whoever you're photographing, you know, if it isn't, you know, a one of a kind event, if they could slow down, if they have a little bit more time, because sometimes when you rush, you make mistakes and there's nothing wrong with taking your time when you're creating art. There's nothing wrong with it at all. If I'm shooting with, you know, the, the, the camera that I just showed you, I have to reload the film. You know, I can't just, just shoot forever. I just can't, you know, replace, you know, the memory card. I just can't delete images. No, I have to take those out. I have to get them developed. So it's, it's, it's given me the ability to take my time and to learn more and to be more passionate, you know, about the art. Now, the reason why um, I, love, I love the work of Gordon Park so much is because he came from a background that a lot of us come from, you know, um, whether younger or, you know, a little bit older. He came from the struggle. He came from the struggle. And growing up, I never knew what I was going to be. I never knew what I was going to do. I, I, I never knew I was going to be a photographer. I never knew I was going to be an image activist. I never knew I was going to, you know, um, visit cities that I'd never even heard of before, you know, documenting issues of social justice. But once you pick up what it is you're supposed to be doing, um, it changes your life. And my favorite artist in the world is Gordon Parks. It is not just because of his quality of work, but his mission and his, his level of passion to the work. This brother was the first of many, right? Like he was the one that was doing it before anybody else was doing it. And he was doing it with a camera that he couldn't see the results in. See, back then, you know, again, film, I can't see what I'm shooting. There's nothing back there. You have to know what you're shooting. That's why the art makes so much sense. That's why knowing what aperture you're shooting at, if we're talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, consumer grade or professional cameras, knowing um, what your shutter speed is, knowing what ISO your film speed is, all of that mattered back in the day. Your camera wasn't going to help you. If you didn't know what you were doing, every single image was going to be horrible and it was going to be expensive. So now we can, you know, shoot quicker and, and, and shoot more. It makes more sense that we can take our time. We can afford to take our time. But I learned all of that literally from Gordon. I learned to, to be more intentional with my images. I learned how not to hurt my subjects. Um, the brother that, that you saw that I, I, I explained that Gordon, you know, would shoot moving, he was a gang leader in Harlem. And Gordon got access long before you know, the Time Magazine and, you know, his other work. He was just, he was in Harlem and he gained access, you know, to um, a group of individuals that people tend to overlook. That's what art does. Art gives you not just the front door, you know, it doesn't just give you an opportunity, it's a responsibility. If he would have um, done wrong with those images, he would have been banned from the community. And I don't mean just took horrible photos. I don't mean that, right? I don't mean that at all. But I mean, you have to be intentional with, with um, the work that you're doing. And I kept that in my mind um, when we were creating Welcome to Brook Hill. I didn't want to just have great photos of Black people. No, I wanted to tell a story in those photos that allowed Black people to become empowered. Sometimes you don't get to interview your subjects, your, you know, the people in front of you. Sometimes you don't get a chance, you know, to write down your conversation. So the photos that you publish, the photos that you deliver have to be photos that they would be proud of photos that, that they would love to show to their family and friends. And the responsibility is not to hurt your community. There's something that I'll never forget. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's impact versus intent. It doesn't matter that you didn't mean to do harm. If you've done harm, you're responsible and you're gonna be held accountable and you should be held accountable. So in all of my work, you're not going to see um, photographs of black and brown men and women committing crimes. There's nothing wrong with, with, with um, exercising your constitutional rights. That's not a crime. There's nothing wrong with being outside. There's nothing wrong with yelling. There's nothing wrong with screaming. There's nothing wrong with any of that. That's legal. That's not a problem. And some things are illegal. There's nothing wrong with that either. But I'm not going to document that and publish that work uh, to help incriminate individuals. That's what I mean by intentionality and um, being responsible. You know, you never know where you're going to be. Uh, and, and, and you never know what time you're going to be. But you have to definitely um, take your time with your subjects. So someone asked, um, how can you make them comfortable to capture a great shot? Okay, if you have a moment, um, talk to people, talk to them, find out 
you know, what they like. Find out how um, they've captured them be their best selves in the past. You know, you don't want to walk up to a houseless person uptown, you know, with a camera, cell phone holding their face, you know, you know, take a picture and walk off. No, that's disrespectful. So your auntie could be uncomfortable and you've known her your whole life. If she's not comfortable with what you're doing and she doesn't know what you're going to do, it's not going to be a great shot. So talking to people helps. A line of communication helps. Because think if someone just walked up to you, you're just walking in the mall and somebody just walks up with a camera and takes your photo. You don't care if it's a $50,000 camera or a $500 iPhone. You're going to be like, hey, hold on, man. Wait a minute. What's going on? That's how people feel. That's how people feel. So I look at that sometimes. I'm like, man, maybe this isn't a good time you know, to have um, my camera out right now. So someone said that, um, notice sometimes people are much more responsive to the photos that reflect on a mood or sentiment that are currently feeling a scenario that they can relate to perfectly. Man, hmm. I like that. Much more responsive to the photos that reflect on the mood. And, and, and absolutely, and I mean, that makes sense. You know, sometimes you don't have to, to uh, reinvent the wheel. You know, if we're, if we're in a protest or you're, you know, capturing a photo of your uncle, you know, um, if there's something that you know they're already going through, that's going to come across. You don't have to tell them to do anything. You're you're kind of holding up a mirror, and that's what cameras do. I think I've said that in an interview before. You know, I'm holding up a very large and um, uncomfortable mirror. You know, to to what's going on in society. Let's see what else I can look at. Okay, um, let me see. The notion of photography is a weapon. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm reading uh, the questions. This photography is a weapon. How common is it understanding of photography among black? Okay, this one is a weapon. Now, photography is a weapon. Um, I remember one time I was capturing um, uh, the Hawthorne Street Bridge, and I had a very large telephoto lens and a, and a, a tripod. Keep in mind, this is a neighborhood that I lived in. I live right down the street off Third, and um, I had this 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 large telephoto lens and a tripod. I'm walking over the bridge. I'm like, man, this could be misconstrued as a weapon. Literally, I'm like, if someone rolled up you know, how, how people are doing this now. Someone has a gun and he's shooting at cars on the bridge. Well, as preposterous as that is, if, you know, members of law enforcement roll up and I have this very large total photo, telephoto lens and camera and it's pointed over the bridge and someone just said that someone was shooting or getting ready to shoot, they're not going to respond to me very favorable, favorably at all. So how common is the understanding of photography among black photographers and journalists? I think we all know now. All the brothers and sisters that I know that are, that are in the field, we get it. I mean, they're woke as woke can be. They have a critical analysis that understands that what we do is not only important, that it's intentional, and we read a lot. Um, we pay homage to our, to our predecessors um, every chance we get. We know we're not the first ones doing this, right? We know that we stand on the shoulders, you know, of um, the brothers and sisters of the past. So everything is political. You know, your art is political. Your work is political. You can't just say, well, I'm just a photographer and I get to go home. Not anymore, not in this climate, because of everything that you're going to be responsible for. Okay, in the instances um, that I'm not able to talk to them beforehand, you know, how do I make the subject comfortable? You know what? Yes. Um, if you aren't able, right, to talk to your subject before, you kind of have to read their body language too. You know, if someone just doesn't want to be bothered, they don't want to be bothered. You don't have to, um, to sneak, you know, photos. If someone doesn't want to be captured, just, you know, ask them if you can, you know, but if you can't talk to them at all, you know, um, the body language of, of the photographer is, 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 is key. You know, someone can tell, you know, if you're up to no good kind of sort of just, just from what you're giving off physically. But um, that's a great question. You know, it is the responsibility of the creator, of the artist, you know, of the, uh, the uh, photographer to make, you know, their clients and their subjects feel comfortable. It's not the other way around. So I think what we're about to do right now, guys, is look at um, some of these photos. Um, I'm gonna get a chance to look at them and we're gonna be able to go through them together um, for a few minutes. I'm gonna see where they're going to pop up. So I can see them. And thank you for sending them all in. This is this is really what this is all about. So we can um we can be interactive. Let's see what we have. Oh, um, how do I think that my that my photography is impacting the world? Boy, um being being compared to him is like I mean. And it's not just like, okay, you know, you're a photographer, he's a photographer. No, it's not that. It's, it's, it's civil rights, it's social justice, it's the way the images look. It's, it's not the level of skill, because I don't have that yet, but I think that we have to continue to create next level. Like I have to, to uh, 
to teach other individuals. You know, I have to empower other individuals to continue this on because in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, we're going to be going through similar, similar struggles and someone's going to have to pick up, pick up that struggle. Remember for a while, there was a, a period of years where the things, things weren't going on like this. In the 60s, we know, you know what was going on. We knew in the 60s, civil rights, civil rights, civil rights. In the 80s, not so much. The 90s, not so much, right? And then it started happening again. So sometimes you kind of skip a generation, um, but I don't think we're ever going to lose, um, lose, lose that struggle again. Okay, let me see. Which question here? Let me see. Um, how do I think it's, it's impacting the world? I mean, from, from the exhibitions, right, from the books, from the talks, I think that the conversation is being had that, that this work is making sense. This work is, 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 is changing the narrative. You know, if we look at Brook Hill alone, right, like not necessarily the world, but just, just you know, a local lens, um, there are like 300 families that, are, that aren't going to be houseless right now. You know, there are, there are families that because of the work and because of, you know, some of what, you know, the community was doing together, people are looking at work differently. They're like, okay, now we can put, we can put a face, you know, to these numbers. We hear numbers all the time. Charlotte is 50 out of 50, 50 out of 50, but whose face are we putting to the struggle? So now <clears throat> we have photos of black men and black women and black children. Um, and we can put that with the data and it's changing some laws, it's changing some policies and it's changing some minds, you know, into how we used to treat people. So putting the work out there, capturing the work, curating the work and putting the work out there and making it available is changing the landscape and the fabric of, of art, of creativity. If you look at the murals and things like that around town, people who aren't necessarily creative or understand creativity and photos like, well, what does that do? What does that do? What does that do? Well, without the photos, without the videos right from all over the country, we don't know what's happening. Look how many conversations we've had. Look how many laws and policies and, and, and things that are changing due to the photos right? Due to the videos, right? Due to the art that is in response to the photos and the video. We're changing the world right now. It's slow. It's slow, right? But we've never seen this much support and solidarity, you know, across races. And these photos, for example, you know, the white women, you know, that were in Portland, right? We've never seen photos like that standing, you know, uh, 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 in front of Black people. We've never seen that before. So that's what this art is doing. And that's what my art is doing because we're putting it out there. Laws are changing in the city. Policies are changing in the city and they're changing around the world. So with every exhibition, you know, with every, um, with every book, you know, with every, um, with every social media update, people around the world are getting to see what's happening around the world in real time. So that's absolutely changing the world because it's giving people firsthand accounts of, um, of, of real world change. Um, I don't, guys, I don't, I, don't, I don't see these photos yet. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't see them yet. So I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Wow. This is good. Okay. Now, this is the rule of thirds. If you guys can see this image, right? The subject is right, is, is almost to the right. This is a great photo. And I love the fact that it's black and white. It's not overblown with highlights. I can see exactly. Wow, this is good. I don't know if this was taken with a cell phone or a, uh, a um, consumer grade camera, but this is good. And I think it's great that it's black and white. I like this. I like this. Okay. This is kind of looks like kind of, I don't want to say a mood board, but I see butterflies. Okay. Now what you do, how this is set up, this is actually a pretty good image, right? And it looks like it's hanging on a wall. So every, I can make out, I can make out the words. Now, if, if, if we were using, um, um, like editing software or something like that, right? There's a ruler in um in our Lightroom. Do you see right where the top of the board is? All I would do was basically draw a chalk line over the board and I just straighten it. That's all you do because you it's almost impossible to capture a photograph straight because you don't have a frame of reference. So we usually do that in post. But I like this photo. These are great colors. Um, it, is this in Spanish? I wish I could read Spanish. I don't know what language it is. Is it Portuguese? Well, this is a great photo. All the good colors. Somebody's getting a lot of work done. Now, remember what I was saying about lighting, right? And when there was a photo of, um, of, of, of Luke when he was painting, if I would have came around the corner, the sunlight would have done exactly what this light is doing. So if you can, right? you move over so you're not directly in front of the light because what the light is going to do is blow your highlights out. So you move over just a bit to the left and then you capture the image kind of at an angle. So the light isn't directly in your lens. So that means that you're going to get more of the detail, you know, in the paperwork and the things, you know, behind the wall. But 
composition is great. That is the rule of thirds. The subject is to the right, and then you still have, have, have information in the middle and information to the left, but the balance is to the right. So that is, that is a good image. So, and, and again, the image isn't necessarily what you're capturing it of. It's like, are you following the rules? And this is following the rules. You just got to move over just a little bit to kind of either cut the light out or angle the light so it's not directly in the lens, blowing the highlights out. My man is chilling. So, okay, when you, when you, when you capture a person, right? I'm in bike week, I'm a rider, a biker. So when you capture an image of a person, right? They don't have to look at you. They don't have to look at you. They may not want to look at you, right? But make sure, make sure that you make sure the background is as it needs to be and the angle is as it needs to be. But this is a portrait. This was, this is one of the, um, the things that, that Gordon Parks did really, really well. And I'm gonna break this, his, his actual style down for you guys in a minute, but this would be a portrait. And I like, this is again, rule of thirds. If you see, it's kind of to the left. It's not directly in the center, right? So if you look at thirds, 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 this is one of those rules and the lighting is even in balance. So this is a good image. Hey, big girl. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Now, this is an interesting angle. Remember I said capturing images, you know, a way that somebody else might not, somebody else might get lower and then they have more of the screen. So this is unique as well. And it's still the rule of thirds. The subject isn't in the middle. So if you can just remember that part, your photos are gonna look different from almost anybody else who can't remember to do that all the time. So this is, this is again, a good image. And the lighting again is balanced. There's nothing blown out. You know, you're looking inside there. There's nothing that's, that's, that's really, really bright or really, really dark. Everything is even and balanced. So that's a good image. I don't know who's taking these, but they are doing their thing. This is good. Did I take this? Is this my photo? It's not. I like this. It looks like my father's mom. My granny Lula um, was from Arkansas and she had beautiful, beautiful hair. This, this, this is a great photo. I don't know who took this. Do you guys see how, how the light is? Now, I know where the light is in the photo. I know right where it is. See right here where, where the sun is coming in? That's not, that's not a, um, a lamp. That's actual light and this is a beautiful image do you see how soft it is around the outside and how like the vignette like the black is around the outside this is a good image i would um i would print this honestly i don't know if this is um a nana if this is a a, a, a auntie if this is a, a mom but i would definitely i would definitely frame this image definitely hold on to it i like this and the choice of black and white is perfect this is a good image i like this let me see now Rule of thirds, again, you've got images and everything is as it needs to sit up. Now, remember what I was saying about separate the background, right? This is background separation. If this was a subject where the laptop was and the wall is where uh, uh, the TV stand and, and, and that is, that's the separation. If it would have been closer, it would have all been a part of the same image and it wouldn't have been such an impactful photo. So that's a great photo. And that's really all you guys have to do, just like separate it, right? Separate it, it works so well. Well, now I'm going to read this to you guys real quick. Okay. Now, his style, right? Um, I was doing a little bit more research and reading a little bit more about, about what I loved about his work. And I'm just going to read this to you a little bit. Um, social realism. His work was real. There was nothing staged. There was nothing that somebody had to go get and put on. He captured them doing what they were doing throughout their day. A lot of folks can't do that, you know, because we don't have access. You don't have access to... Um, you know, maybe uh, uh, Reverend Barber, you know, in Raleigh, not as he's outside, you know, uh, uh, doing a rally or a protest, but maybe in his study, right? And, and, and maybe he's at the dinner table. That was the access that Gordon Parks had. Uh, civil rights, segregation, and poverty. That was his thing. If you asked him what he did, he'd be like, I, I captured, you know, civil rights, segregation, and poverty, because that was the era. That's what was going on back then. And if we're talking about, you know, social documentary um, of the 1940s to the 1970s, it'd be hard to talk about anyone who had more impact than he did. You know, if we're talking about um, our culture, you know, and our people, he did everything he could possibly do um, to make us look our best. And among some of those iconic figures, you know, of history. I mean, I love that, man. I, I, I love that he not only had access, but he did everything he could, you know, to make us look good, to make us feel good. And we don't always have access like that. There's some folks out there, guys, you've seen photos of yourself that were published that are horrible. 
you know, um, whether, whether, you know, you're at a protest or whether, you know, you're at a basketball game or you know, you're at an event, you're like, why did you take that photo and send it? Like, I get you took it. I get it. Like, you know, we can't always take perfect photos. But why did you publish that? Why did you put that out, you know, for everybody else to see it? You have to look at things like that, you know, when you capture photos. But that really is his style as an icon and, in my opinion, as the greatest of all time. You know, uh, we call that the GOAT. You know, he is better than anyone, you know, um, now until, you know, well, then until now, in my opinion, in, in what he did. Have any more questions? Um, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, so the tips. I can't remember what they are, but again, the rule of thirds, and I can't tell you that enough, right? That is going to change your photos from the photo being here, from it being here, and from it being here. And I'll show you what that looks like real quick. Okay, this is me right in the center, right? So if I was going to capture a photo of me, I wouldn't capture me being here. I'm going to move to the right. I captured me in the photo here. That's a rule of thirds. This is not, this is a rule of thirds. I haven't moved front or back, I've just moved laterally. But that allows you to draw your eye to me, the subject. If it's here, you're like, okay, you know, it's cool, whatever, you know, it's not going on. But this makes a more interesting photo. This is more interesting. This is more interesting than this. Now, let's talk lighting real quick. Lighting to me is extremely important, especially with Zoom calls and things like that, right? Now, this this is pretty balanced lighting. Um, this is This is sunlight temperature. Now, what if I do this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the lighting up real quick. This is what lighting does. I'm not gonna move me, but I'm gonna change the lighting. Okay, now watch this. This is me with good lighting, right? Hold on, see that? The highlights are blown out. That's not good lighting. I didn't move, I moved the lighting. Hold on, I'm gonna keep going. See, I didn't move, I just moved the lighting. That's why it's so important to control it. Bam, I didn't even move. That's important, lighting. When you control it, you can control your art. You can control your photography and you'll be a much better shooter, even with a cell phone. If you can't move the light yourself, you move. Move into the light, move away from the light. And look at the image when you take it. Look at it, you don't have to publish it. If it's not good, you know, try to take another one. And composition, um, try to make sure you don't have a whole lot going on that you can't control in the background. If you do have a lot going on in the background that you can't control, separate yourself from it. Step away from the wall, step away from the construction, step away from, you know, the classroom, just back up a little bit or move forward a little bit. You're going to create a divide and you're going to have a much better image. But listen, guys, thank you to the Gantt. Thank you to Navant. Um, this wouldn't happen without you guys. I appreciate the ability, man, to speak to so many people today. I was excited about this. I've never had the ability to speak on my, my mentor. He died in 2006. Um, just the greatest artist, you know, photographer, uh, renaissance man that I've ever known. And without, you know, the Gantt, without, you know, Navant Health, we couldn't make this happen today. So I appreciate you guys. I appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, I appreciate the interaction, the questions you guys asked. Thank you for the photos. Um, this was so much fun, guys. If you guys have any other questions, um, please let us know. Uh, please continue sending the photos either, um, you know, to the email and the chat. We're going to be able to have those. We're going to review those soon. You guys have been great. You guys have been so great. Um, let me see what else I'm looking at here. Um, if, if there's any more questions, we have like two minutes. I can answer maybe one or two more questions if you guys have any. But you guys have been amazing. Oh, those are good. That big old John Deere tractor. These are good. Okay. Mm hmm. This is good stuff, guys. Thank you guys so much. This was so much fun. So much fun. Now I got to go out and take some photos again today. Wait, so there's another question? Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Cool. All right, guys. We got one more minute. But really appreciate you guys. Um, get back to get back to work. Me and my baby. And um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.
Thank you for joining Family First, Arts from a Distance. We hope you enjoyed this afternoon's program. Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to the Harvey Began Center's official YouTube page for updates on future workshops and other programs. To continue the free programs that highlight some of the best in Black arts and culture, please consider supporting the Gantt Center via our Text to Give platform. By texting UNMASKED to 345-345, you help further our mission. All contributions matter and truly make a difference. Finally, join us next Tuesday, July 28th at 7 p.m. for our first open air studio visit with painter Mario Moore for a behind the scenes look at the art making process.